2024 NFL Draft has come and gone, and we now know who all 32 teams have taken during the draft. So, with that being said, we're going to do a way too early discussion about what we are grading each of those teams' draft picks. Obviously, we're not going to know for years who won this draft, but we can have a way too early discussion. But before we get into the video, I want to take a quick second to ask you to please subscribe to the channel, ring the bell for notifications. It really helps us out. If you're a fan of the NFL, you'll love this channel as we release multiple NFL-related videos every Tuesday and Friday all year long. Now, let's get back to the video. Now, we're going to start with the Chicago Bears. The Chicago Bears had a fairly chalk draft. I mean, yes, they definitely improved their team massively, bringing in Caleb Williams and Roma Dunze. But at the end of the day, Caleb Williams was always going to be theirs given they had the first overall pick. And Roma Dunze was always likely to be around at the ninth overall pick. So there wasn't any crazy pick the Bears made. I gave them a little bit of a bump because they did take the top punter off the board. And I actually think punter is the most undervalued position in football. Anyone who's watched me on stream has heard me talk about this from time to time. Just given that changing of field can be such a massive game changer in football so a fairly chalk draft one kind of nice thing I give them a B plus doesn't mean their team's not a lot better but we knew they were going to be able to do this with the picks at their disposal next up is the Detroit Lions who have given an A minus two and the theme of their draft was cornerback 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 they traded a third round pick along with their 29th overall pick to move up to 24th to take Terry and Arnold one of the top cornerbacks on the board with their second round pick, they took another cornerback. And with their other third round pick they had in the offseason, prior to the draft, they traded it to the Buccaneers for a cornerback. They just decided, we are a really good team, we're a really young team, but one position we need to improve on is corner. They put all their eggs into that basket with the hope that one or two of these guys can work out and make this passing defense much better than it was this past year, where admittedly it was a bit of a liability. I give it a minus because they definitely filled a need, but they had some other needs, like a little bit of wide receiver, a little bit of edge rusher that I don't think they adequately filled. So it's only an A minus. The Green Bay Packers are next and I give them a B. I don't think they had a bad draft, but I think they just got beat a little bit in the draft. I mean, look at what happened in the draft. They have the 25th overall pick. The Lions jump up to 24 and take Terry and Arnold at cornerback, a position that the Green Bay Packers needed. Then in the second round, the Packers have the 41st overall pick, but the Eagles move up to 40 and take Cooper DeGene, another player the Packers really could have used. It felt like twice in this draft, the Packers just got leapfrogged in order for them to lose their guy. So while their draft in total wasn't that bad, I don't love Martin at 25, but it's not an awful pick. I just don't think that the Packers were firing on all cylinders, and so I give them a B. Our final NFC North team is the Minnesota Vikings, and I'm giving them an A. We all thought they would have to trade both their first round picks plus some future assets just in order to get J.J. McCarthy. Instead, they were able to get J.J. McCarthy, plus they were able to get Dallas Turner, widely considered the top edge rusher in the draft, and they had to give up less than they likely would have to get McCarthy alone, at least based on most pre-draft rankings. At the end of the day, the Vikings didn't do anything special in the following rounds, but given how good their round one was, I think the best round one out of any team in this draft, I'm giving their overall draft an A. Next up, we have the Washington Commanders, who I'm also giving an A to. Now, the Commanders didn't do anything crazy. They picked Jaden Daniels at two, fairly chalk pick. I don't even think he's the second best quarterback on the board. I prefer Drake May personally, but... The commander still filled a ton of holes for a team that had a ton of holes. They had six picks in the first three rounds. They used them at all positions of need for the team. And so this is a team that I think is a lot better going into 2024 than they were in 2023. And so they get an A for a pretty well done draft. Moving on to the Dallas Cowboys. And the Dallas Cowboys draft was hit and miss to me. I loved the first round trade they made. They moved down from 24 to 29 and took Tyler Guyton, who I think was the best offensive tackle on the board at 24 anyway, and it's in the biggest position of need for the Cowboys. They also managed to grab a third round pick out of that that they used to draft Cooper Beebe or Beeb or however you pronounce it, who's a really good offensive guard. And so you basically turned the 24th overall pick into two potential starting offensive linemen day one. That's really good. But this is also a team that should be in win now and claims they're all in and win now. 
And that's just not a sexy move to try to say, no, we're here to compete today. They didn't make any moves that felt like they were here to compete today. This really felt like their free agency period where it was just business as usual. And so I gave the Cowboys a B. I think that move was really good, but it just doesn't line up with what the team totally needs in the short term. Long term, yes. Short term, no. The Philadelphia Eagles are a third NFC East team and I am giving them an A+. Plus, I gave three A pluses, and the Eagles are the first of those three A pluses. This draft, I think, was incredible. First of all, they got Quinion Mitchell, the number one overall cornerback, at least on their board, at the 22nd pick. Now, I don't like Mitchell as much as I like Terry and Arnold, who the Lions got, but I really like that you were able to get Mitchell at 22. And heck, if he's your number one corner on the board and you got him at 22, that's a win. Then they were able to leapfrog the Packers to select Cooper DeGene, another really good corner, maybe even short-term safety that they got in the second round, who was widely considered to be a must-pick first-round prospect, widely considered to be picked around the Eagles' first-round pick. And then after that, the Eagles just went on to round out positions of need. They got an edge rusher. They got some depth offensive linemen, given the ages of their offensive linemen and recent retirement of Jason Kelsey. It just felt like the Eagles hit every single thing they needed to hit in terms of their needs, and they got great value across the board. It's an A+. I hate to say it. I wish I wasn't saying it, but I gotta be honest. Our final NFC East team is the New York Giants, and I've given them a B-. Now, I think the Malik Neighbors pick is a good pick, and it's their first theoretically good wide receiver since OBJ, also out of LSU. But You passed on J.J. McCarthy at the sixth overall pick, and while I don't think that's a terrible decision, it's also a little head-scratching. I don't know what the New York Giants' intention or goals are. They seem to really want a quarterback, but also not really want a quarterback. Maybe they only wanted Drake May. I don't know. I didn't think the rest of their draft was anything special either. Nobody that I thought was an absolute slam dunk of a pick. They did get Tyler Newbin, who's a pretty solid safety in the second round. But again, this is a team that has so many holes on the roster. They've just lost their best offensive player by a mile in Saquon in the offseason. And I just don't really see what the New York Giants have going for them moving forward. And so it gets a B minus. It's not a bad draft, but it's just like, I don't think the team is going to be great or this draft changed their fortune in any way. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers are our first team down in the NFC South and I'm giving them a B plus. I would have liked for them to take an edge rusher in the first round, but given Chop Robinson, Dallas Turner, Liatu Latu, and Jared Verse were already off the board, I didn't hate them taking Graham Barton in the first round. This is an offensive lineman that can really play outside or inside, so he's very versatile and can fit really well with a Buccaneers offensive line that could really use a plug-and-play kind of guy. They did end up picking up an edge rusher in the second round with Braswell out of Alabama. And all told, I just think this was a solid, solid draft. I don't think there was anything sexy here. I'm not saying the Buccaneers wowed me, which is why they didn't get an A-rated grade. But I think it was a really good draft. They filled positions of need. They got good players. They didn't overreach for anyone. So it's a B plus. The Atlanta Falcons are an F. This is the only F I've given. In fact, I didn't even give a D to anyone. The only F is the Falcons and it stands for Falcons because what the F are the Falcons doing? I mean, none of the rest of this draft matters. I understand they needed front four, front seven, and they got four of their first five picks were front seven. But it doesn't matter to me because they picked Michael Penix Jr. at 8th overall. This is a guy that widely was considered to potentially drop outside the first round even. And yet he's the number 4 quarterback off the board. Goes 8th overall to the Atlanta Falcons. A team that just signed Kirk Cousins to a 4 year $180 million contract. And by the time that contract's done, Michael Penix is going to be 28 years old. Let me be clear, this is not a knock on Penix. This is not even a knock on Penix being taken at that pick. If you really like a quarterback, I understand taking a quarterback in a position where you like them or when you have a pick, even if it doesn't totally make sense to their draft stock. We've seen it plenty of times in the past, and sometimes it works out. But for Michael Penix Jr. to go to a team that just signed a 36-year-old Kirk Cousins to try to win now, this is the least win-now move for a team that just had the most win-now moves in the off season. At the end of the day, your off season has to be contiguous. It has to be logical. It has to make sense together. 
And this offseason really seems like the Falcons are pulling themselves in two completely different directions. And there's a lot of talk from the Falcons that they want to follow the Green Bay Packer method. Well, I'm going to tell you, this is not the Green Bay Packer method. Yes, the Packers drafted Rodgers when they still had Favre. Yes, the Packers drafted Love when they still had Rodgers. But look at those picks in a vacuum. The Packers drafted those guys at 24th and 26th overall, respectively. Not at 8th overall. They also drafted them when they had guys that were threatening retirement. Not when they had just signed a guy for a four-year deal who wants to be there for the entirety of that contract. And so when you're drafting guy way higher who is older and to replace a guy that's not looking to leave, this is not the Green Bay method. And so this is an F. I know I've talked about this a long time. I'm going to stop now. It's just an F. The Carolina Panthers get a C grade. It's tough to give anything better to a Panthers team. That was the worst team in the NFL last year and didn't even have their first overall pick thanks to a trade they made last season at the draft to get Bryce Young first overall. And so the Panthers did end up getting a first round pick, but only because they traded into it. They didn't get a ton of guys with great value. They didn't get a ton of high upside guys for a team that has needs all across the field. And so it's a C. It's tough for this to have been better. They would have had to get a lot of guys that fell drastically, but they didn't, so it's a C. The New Orleans Saints are the second of three A-plus teams. I think they had a fantastic draft. They start off by taking offensive tackle Fuaga, who I think is a fantastic pick, fills a position of massive need for the Saints, and was a great pick at that value. I think they wanted Fashanu. He obviously went to the Jets at number 11, but you still got a really good offensive tackle. You're still happy if you're the Saints. And then what happened in the second round? Well, you traded up to get Kool-Aid McKinstry at cornerback. Another massive position of need. And a guy who fell drastically was widely considered to be picked in the first round. And so you got two absolute studs, absolute day one starters in positions of need. And then you went on to draft Spencer Rattler, the seventh quarterback off the board in the fifth round. The Saints didn't have a ton of draft capital coming into this draft. But it seems like every pick they made was a slam dunk pick with great value. They took maximum advantage of the value they had in terms of their picks, and so they get an A-plus from me. The San Francisco 49ers are the first team in the NFC West, and they get a B-minus from me. I think this is a pretty generous grade because I think the San Francisco 49ers had a bit of a weird draft, all told. So they ended up taking Ricky Pearsall at the 31st overall pick, which is a bit of a jump at wide receiver, but could have made sense if they were planning on trading away Brandon Ayuk or Debo Samuel. But guess what? They didn't trade either of those guys away. At least they haven't yet. And now if you trade those guys away for draft picks, you're getting it in next year's draft, which is not good for a team that is in win now mode. And if you're not trading away any of those guys, well, where does Ricky Pearsall even fit into this team? They already have Ayuk and Debo Samuel. They already have George Kittle and Christian McCaffrey as other pass catchers. And I personally think Jawan Jennings, the wide receiver three of the 49ers, is one of the best wide receiver threes in the NFL. And so Pearsall slots in at what? The fourth wide receiver and the sixth option pass catcher? Maybe even seventh if you include Kyle Juszczyk. This just doesn't make sense for a team that's in win-now mode, seeing as they just made the Super Bowl and are still considered one of the best teams in the NFL. And then beyond that, their biggest position of need was offensive tackle. And yes, they filled that, but not until the third round of the draft. Why not fill that in the first round? Maybe even try to trade up if you don't have that many needs. So I'm giving the 49ers a B minus here because this is just a team that's earned a little bit of trust and they didn't have that many needs. So it's hard to screw up this draft if you're the 49ers. But a lot of the 49ers moves just didn't make a ton of sense to me. The Arizona Cardinals are next and they had a slew of draft picks in this draft. They had 12 draft picks. That's an insane number of draft picks coming into a given team. And of those 12 draft picks, seven were in the first three rounds. So you'd expect the Cardinals to have a pretty decent draft. And they did. They got Marvin Harrison Jr. with the fourth overall pick. Yes, this was a pretty chalk pick, but still, it's always a positive getting the best overall player on your team in your biggest position of need. Absolute win right there. Then you went on and got Darius Robinson at edge rusher. I would have preferred a cornerback in this pick, but heck, I'm never mad at an edge rusher. The fifth best edge rusher off the board. You get it 27th. And then you go and get a cornerback with your very next pick 
in the mid-second round. So all told, these were some pretty solid picks from the Arizona Cardinals. They rounded out their roster well. They filled a lot of the holes. I don't think they had any massive slam dunk value picks, which is the only reason I'm not giving them an A+. I don't think they're quite at the same level as the Eagles or the Saints were in terms of some slam dunk. That was a great move, great pick, but... Just an all-around really, really good draft, which is why they get an A. The Los Angeles Rams get a B-plus from me. I think getting Jared Verse in the first round at number 19 was really good value for a very solid edge rusher out of Florida State. And they stuck with the Florida State well in the second round, getting another defensive lineman, this time an interior guy, in Braden Fiske. They followed it up with Blake Corum, a national championship winning running back, who I'm sure Jim Harbaugh is going to be pretty pissed to see playing in his stadium, but on the other team. All told, I think the Rams had a really good draft, a draft somewhat similar to last year, which was an absolute stellar draft, where they just hit all the guys they needed to hit. We obviously don't know if these later round picks are going to hit quite like they did in last year's draft for the Rams, and so I'm only giving them a B plus, but I do think they filled a good number of needs. I think they got some good picks there, but again, just not any crazy value to give them an A grade. And our final NFC team is the Seattle Seahawks, who I've given a B minus to. The Seahawks took Byron Murphy as their first round pick. And while I really like Byron Murphy, I didn't make a ton of sense for me for the Seahawks to pick him. Why? Because the Seahawks already have Leonard Williams up the middle. They really needed interior offensive linemen or exterior defensive linemen. Byron Murphy is neither of which. Yes, in the third round, they did get an offensive guard out of UConn. They made some later round picks. And I'm never going to totally knock John Schneider, who has had numerous exceptional drafts in his Seahawks tenure. So maybe I'm wrong, which is why I'm not dropping this to as low as a C-rated grade. But I'm still giving it a B- minus because a lot of the picks just didn't seem to make sense for a team that seems stuck in no man's land. They're trying to compete but they're not really good enough to compete, but they're also too good to bottom out and get good picks. And while John Schneider keeps drafting decently well, it feels like they're just going to be stuck in this no man's land for the foreseeable future. The Cincinnati Bengals are our first AFC team, and I'm giving them an A-. minus. I think they had a pretty darn good draft. Their first round pick, they ended up taking an offensive tackle in Marius Mims. It's also extra special for them because Marius Mims was widely linked to the Pittsburgh Steelers. But now, the Cincinnati Bengals have him playing for a division rival, which is always going to piss off the Steelers. So, extra points Bengals for that. But beyond that, I had their biggest position of need as interior defensive linemen. Guess what? A second and a third round pick went and took an interior defensive lineman. Offensive tackle has always been a position of need for the Bengals. That was their first round pick. And then wide receivers, a big question mark with T. Higgins on the franchise tag. So another third round pick used on a wide receiver. They just kept smacking their needs on the nose. They know they're a win now team. They know they're a team that needs to fill their needs and they did that exceptionally. And so they get an A minus. Again, nothing exceptional here, no crazy value, but good job filling your needs. A minus it is. Next up, we have the Cleveland Browns and the Browns get a C from me. The Browns have a tough time in the draft. They traded away so many picks for Deshaun Watson, which yeah, that's not a great trade at all. But they'd still get a C because they did somewhat fill some positions of need. They did take their biggest position of need, in my opinion, interior defensive lineman, as their first pick off the board in the mid-second round. They also picked interior offensive lineman, which was another bit of a position of need for the Browns. This is a team that has a really good roster. While I don't love their quarterback, they are paying him so much money, they gotta trust that this roster can win with Watson at quarterback. And outside of Watson, I think their roster is pretty good, all told. So I don't hate their draft, but... When you have so little draft capital, it's never going to be much higher than a C. The Ravens draft, to me, is very similar to the Bengals draft in the sense that they just targeted positions of need and filled those needs, which is why, similar to the Bengals, they're also getting an A-. They got really good value on Nate Wiggins with the 30th pick in the first round. This guy was expected to go way higher than that. And so getting the third corner off the board at 30, well done, Ravens. Beyond that, they get an edge rusher to replace a guy like Clowney in that defensive front, which has been a massive part of that Ravens defense this past year. They got a wide receiver in the early rounds to kind of replace that OBJ role. And they got an offensive tackle, a massive position of need, especially after trading away Morgan Moses. They literally just took their needs, filled it, and this team is going to be a force 
moving into this coming year, A-. minus. And our final AFC North team is another AFC North team that absolutely crushed the draft. It's no wonder this is one of the best divisions in football, is it? These teams are so well managed seemingly across the board, minus maybe the Browns. But still, the Steelers had a great draft. Again, filling all their needs. Yes, they missed out on Amarius Mims, who we all know they really wanted. But they were able to pick Troy Fautanu, who's a really good offensive lineman that can play all across the offensive line, whether that be guard or tackle. Maybe not center, but heck, he could even play center potentially. But even if he can't play center, it doesn't matter because their second round pick was Zach Frazier at center, filling that potential need. So their first two round picks, improving the offensive line, a massive position of need for this team, especially when you have Russell Wilson, a bit of an undersized quarterback who's a little bit slower than he used to be. Offensive linemen are crucial for his ability to be successful. Then what do the Steelers do in the third round? They take a wide receiver who replaces Deontay Johnson and the Steelers, at least during the Mike Tomlin era, have been exceptional at picking mid, late round wide receivers. I mean, look at their wide receiver rooms they've had in the past. Emmanuel Sanders, Antonio Brown, Deontay Johnson, George Pickens, Mike Wallace. None of these guys were first round picks. This team is really good at picking wide receivers in the mid round. And who knows, we might have found another one. So the Steelers, I'm not quite giving them the A plus because I don't think they're on the same level as the Saints and the Eagles and one more team to come. But they still deserve a little bit higher than teams like the Bengals and Ravens, so they get an A. The Buffalo Bills are a team that I think had a surprisingly good draft. A lot of people question why the Bills traded down with the Chiefs from the 28th pick and then again out of the first round altogether. And I saw a lot of the Bills memes online saying they were staying up for this. It was pretty funny. But let's look at what the Bills actually got. They got Keon Coleman, who I will acknowledge. I like Keon Coleman a lot more than a lot of people, which is part of the reason they get as good a grade as I've given them. But beyond that, the Bills had a mass exodus of players, and they realized what they needed to do was improve their depth. So they traded down a bunch of times in this draft to just grab some additional assets, and they ended up with 10 picks in this draft. Yes, I understand that six of those 10 picks were between rounds five through seven. So pretty late picks. But I think they filled a lot of the positions of need, a lot of the holes that they had on their roster, while also getting some good value at the top end in a guy like Keon Coleman, who really only fell to where he did in the draft because his 40 time was a little slow. This guy was widely considered the number four wide receiver on the board before people started looking at his 40 time. And so getting him where you got him, I think is a pretty good deal for the Bills. The Miami Dolphins are next and the Dolphins get a C from me. I just don't really understand the Dolphins draft. To me, they had two massive positions of need, interior offensive linemen and interior defensive linemen. And it's one thing to say, maybe you don't think those positions are that valuable. Maybe you target them later on in the draft. But they didn't pick either of those positions. And they just lost guys like Robert Hunt and Christian Wilkins for $100 million contracts to other teams. So if anybody should know that these positions can be massive value, it should be the Miami Dolphins. But guess what? They did prioritize either of those positions. Now they have massive holes on both sides of the ball in the middle of the field. I don't love it from the Dolphins who just picked positions that they seemingly already had decent depth at. This is a team that's trying to win now, but they didn't really make win now decisions because these decisions just seem to be maybe who they thought was best player available, not best fit for a team trying to compete today. And so they get a C from me just because... It didn't make sense. The New York Jets had a bit of an interesting draft to me. I really thought they were going to target Brock Bowers in this draft, but they ended up taking Fashanu, who I really like as a player. It doesn't totally make sense to me, given they traded for Moses Malone at offensive tackle and signed Tyron Smith at offensive tackle, only to use their first round pick on a third offensive tackle. Maybe they just want additional depth. Maybe they think Fashanu is more of a project or maybe they're planning to kick someone inside. I don't know what the plan is, but obviously Fashanu a really good pick. Additionally, taking Jordan Travis in the fifth round, I think was a really good pick as a guy to groom a little bit behind Aaron Rodgers and to replace that backup quarterback role that's going to be kind of empty, especially now that Zach Wilson has just been traded away to the Denver Broncos. And I mean, good riddance for the Jets. 
So it's a solid draft. It's a B plus from me. Again, I don't think they made their team significantly better when they're in win now mode, which the only reason it's not an A because either you're kicking someone inside where we don't know how that's going to work or your first round pick effectively just replaces a traded for asset, a signed asset, or doesn't start. But you have a better team long term and that's always a win, so it's a B plus. The New England Patriots are the final AFC East team and I'm giving them a B. B is kind of my chalk grade where I'm like, eh, you kind of just did the draft. Are you better because you got these guys? Yeah. Did you do anything crazy? Not really. Obviously getting Drake May is great for the New England Patriots. I think he's a fantastic quarterback. He was my second rated quarterback on the board. New England got him at the third overall pick. And so that's a bit of a win, but it was always expected he was gonna drop here. The Patriots didn't do anything crazy. They took a wide receiver in Jalen Polk in the second round, a guy that I think was a little bit of a reach. There was other wide receivers I like more in this position, but hey, not a bad pick, good positional need. I'm okay with it. Always trust your draft board. I'm going to defer to teams more than I defer to myself because they spend a little more time looking at those draft boards than I do. Either way, Patriots did nothing special, but they definitely didn't screw up this draft, so it's a B. The Colts are my third and final A-plus graded draft, and you do not need to look any further than their first two picks to understand why. Starting out with the 15th overall pick, they take Liatu Latu. Now, I did not have Liatu Latu as my number one edge rusher or my number one defender at that, but the Colts clearly did because they took the number one defensive player, at least on their board, at the 15th overall pick. That is always going to be a win of a draft pick, no matter what, getting a best defensive player in the draft at 15. Following that, at the 52nd overall pick, the Colts were able to select Adonai Mitchell out of Texas. This is a guy that was widely considered to go towards the back end of the first round, and you get him towards the back end of the second round. This was a massive position of need for the Colts too, who needed a wide receiver opposite of Michael Pittman Jr., given Josh Downs was more of an underneath guy. And so now you have a really good wide receiver room in Indianapolis. You got a really good edge rusher. I understand it doesn't really fill the cornerback need, which I did put as the Colts' biggest position of need in my pre-draft rankings of positional needs, but they did pick a cornerback at least with a sixth round pick. It's not great, but they at least knew they needed someone there. And all told, the Colts just did so well with those first two picks getting such good value. I still give them an A+, even though their positional need might not have been the best draft. The Jaguars, I've given a C+, primarily because I just don't totally understand their first pick in the draft. Yes, they traded down in the draft, similar to what they have done in previous years. This is a team that seems to like trading down in drafts. And at 23rd overall, they took Brian Thomas, wide receiver out of LSU, the second wide receiver out of LSU taken in the draft, which is crazy. But I don't really understand why the Jacksonville Jaguars wanted a wide receiver. They already had Christian Kirk and Zay Jones. They signed Gabe Davis in free agency. And so now you're getting a fourth starting caliber wide receiver in Brian Thomas. Maybe you don't totally like Christian Kirk and Zay Jones. That's fine. Maybe you don't like Gabe Davis. That's also fine. But it doesn't seem like any of those guys should be on the roster as a wide receiver four. If you intended of targeting a wide receiver in the first round of this draft, why did you go out and sign Gabe Davis? That just doesn't really make sense to me. And so I don't love what the Jaguars were doing here. They really needed a cornerback in this team. And yeah, they got one in the third round, but like there were plenty of really good cornerbacks on the board at the 23rd overall pick. In fact, they could have gotten Terry and Arnold, my number one cornerback off the board at this point in time. They could have stayed at their regular pick and also gotten Quinion Mitchell if they had wanted him. But instead, they targeted a wide receiver. I just don't totally understand it. The draft wasn't awful, but it just didn't make a ton of sense, which is why I gave it a C+. The Houston Texans had a fairly mid-draft. I mean, I didn't expect anything different from the Texans. They clearly had already done most of their moves in the offseason. They signed guys like Daniil Hunter in the offseason. They traded for a guy like Stephon Diggs. Last year at the draft, they traded this year's first round pick in order to move up to get Will Anderson last year. And they traded their other first round pick from the Cleveland Browns about a month ago to the Minnesota Vikings in order to move into the second round instead. All that being said though, the Houston Texans didn't really address the one glaring position of need that I saw for this team, that being interior defensive linemen. 
they were widely associated with trying to sign Chris Jones in the offseason for a reason. And that's because they know their defense's big hole is down the middle. And so what do they do to address that? They pick a defensive interior lineman with a seventh round pick. I mean, that's not good enough for a team that's really doing a lot of win now moves. Like trading for Stephon Dix is win now. Signing Daniil Hunter is win now. The moves that this team is making is win now. But the draft didn't totally feel win now. I won't knock them too hard. They had a really good draft last year when it was a new regime in place. So maybe they did the same thing this year. We don't know too much, so I'm still giving them a B-, minus, but it just didn't really feel like they filled the positions of need that this team still has. Our final AFC South team is the Tennessee Titans, and I'm also giving them a B-, minus because I didn't think they did a great job at filling both their positions of need. So their first position of need that I barely put over the other was offensive tackle. And yes, with the seventh overall pick, they picked J.C. Latham. I think this was a bit of a reach for Latham. I totally would have understand taking Joe Alt here if Alt had fallen to seventh, like a lot of people expected him to. But with the Chargers taking Alt at five and not trading out of the pick, all of a sudden the Titans had a decision to make and they ended up drafting J.C. Latham. I would have preferred they draft a guy like Roma Dunze at wide receiver, which I think is much more a position of need for the Houston Texans. But instead, they only get Jaquan Jackson in the sixth round at wide receiver. J.C. Latham's not a bad pick. It's a bit of a stretch. But when you leave your team with only DeAndre Hopkins, who's quite old for a wide receiver... Calvin Ridley, who's on a ridiculously bad contract and is 29 years old and hasn't had a productive season in about four or five years, and Traylon Burks, an absolute bust of a first-round pick wide receiver, and that's your receiving core for your sophomore quarterback and Will Levis? That's not good enough. You have to address that need. The fact that the Titans didn't gives them a B-. And the only reason they get that B- is because at the very least, They stuck to their identity and went with an offensive lineman in J.C. Latham. I'll give him some credit for that. Moving on to our final division, we start with the Denver Broncos, who I've given a B grade to. They did fill their massive position of need at quarterback because nobody wanted to see Jarrett Stidham versus Zach Wilson for a quarterback job. So getting Bo Nix is a massive win for the Broncos. He may not start week one, but I'd be shocked if Bo Nix isn't starting by the end of the season. After this, you got an absolute steal if you're the Broncos with Troy Franklin in the fourth round. How on earth do you get Troy Franklin in the fourth round? This guy was potentially going in the first round in some mock drafts, yet he falls to the fourth for the Broncos. Absolute steal of a pick there for the Broncos. But I still give this team a B, and you might question why I give this team a B, and it's because outside of that, I didn't totally love their draft. And let's be clear, I don't think Bo Nix at 12th overall is good value for a quarterback by any means. Did they have to do it? Yeah, they kind of had to do it. Russell Wilson forced their hand. But at the end of the day, I don't love the value of Bo Nix at 12th overall. The sixth quarterback off the board at 12th overall just seems way too expensive to me. So I am going to knock them down a bit because of that, but just give them a fairly average grade of B. For the Los Angeles Chargers, I'm giving them a B plus. I think Joe Alt's a great pick at fifth overall, though I know Chargers fans, and a bit myself, would have liked them to trade out of this pick to acquire more assets and still get some pretty good guys on that offensive line as well as a first round wide receiver. But they ended up moving up in the second round to take Lad McConkey early on, who's a good wide receiver out of Georgia and immediately becomes the number one wide receiver on this Chargers team because, sorry, Josh Palmer and Quinton Johnson ain't cutting it there. I came close to giving the Chargers an A grade, but I knocked them down to a B plus exclusively because Jim Harbaugh allowed Blake Corum to go to their in-stadium rivals in the Rams. And so the Chargers got to take a point off for that because we all knew the Chargers were going after Blake Corum pretty hard. The Kansas City Chiefs, I've given a B- to, and I actually think this is a pretty generous grade to give the Kansas City Chiefs. Because what did they need in this draft? Well, they needed a wide receiver, and they got one in the first round. They traded up from 32 to 28 to take Xavier Worthy. The guy who had a 4.21 combine 40-yard dash, the best of all time. But that pick didn't make a ton of sense to me. You already signed Hollywood Brown, who plays a similar role in the offense. 
in the offseason. Getting a second speedster didn't really seem like it filled a massive need. At the end of the day, Rashi Rice was so effective last year because he wasn't like that speedster receiver. And a lot of the speedsters they've drafted recently, outside of obviously when they had Tyreek Hill, haven't really worked out for the Chiefs because the hands weren't totally there. This guy wasn't even the number one receiver on his own team. That was Adonai Mitchell. The only reason this guy is going so high in the draft is because his 40-yard dash time is so crazy. But guess who else has had crazy 40-yard dash times? Henry Ruggs or John Ross. Guess what? Neither of these guys became great receivers. It's not just speed. Speed isn't everything for a wide receiver. Does it help? Yes. Is it the be-all, end-all? No. And beyond just that, I think the Kansas City Chiefs had another massive need, that being cornerback. And with all the cornerbacks dropping in this draft, the Kansas City Chiefs should have been like kids in candy store. But instead, they don't take a cornerback until the sixth round. It just didn't feel like this team adequately met their needs. And even where they did meet their needs, they didn't meet the player archetype needs that I feel like they have. So I'm giving them a B minus. And our final team is the Las Vegas Raiders, who I'm giving an A minus grade to. It's tough and it might seem weird to give an A- minus grade to a team whose biggest need was quarterback and who didn't even take a quarterback. Check out my hot takes video where I literally said I didn't think they were going to take a quarterback. But I don't hate the Raiders draft. I actually really like it. Brock Bowers was a bit of an interesting pick, especially after this team took Michael Mayer in the early second round last year. But they decided to just go best player available in the first round. And I think a lot of people would agree that at 13th overall, Brock Bowers was the best player available in the draft at that time. Then they go and get Jackson Powers Johnson, one of the best pure centers in the draft in the mid second round. And finally, in the third round, they get an offensive tackle. This team is clearly building from the offensive line and the defensive line out. This goes in tandem with their signing of Christian Wilkins in the offseason to go alongside Max Crosby. Antonio Pierce has a vision for this team. I see the vision. It is cohesive. It makes sense. It's built with big boys in the trenches. I'm all for it. And so they still get an A-, minus, even though they didn't meet the quarterback need. But I expect them to do that in a later draft. And that's it for my 2024 NFL Draft Grades. Let me know in the comments below who you think knocked this draft out of the park and who you think kind of sold a little bit in the draft. I'd love to have that conversation down there. Either way, we'll be back in a few days with another NFL video. And until next time, peace!